We have reached the final session of the National Press Foundation's America's Long-Term Crisis Journalism Fellowship Program. And the title for this session truly does sum up the incredible amount of information that we have received and processed over the past few days. We call this session Scorecards and Bottom Lines because I think what we need to do as we head back into our newsrooms is really process what we've learned and deliver it to our viewers, listeners, and readers in ways that help them make some solid decisions based on context and truly the information that they need. And we have two uh, powerhouse uh, speakers to help us do that today. We're joined today by Sarita Mohanty. She is the president and CEO of the SCAN Foundation. It's one of the uh, leading uh, uh, foundations that deal with issues of aging in America, and they've worked closely with AARP through the years. And we're also joined by someone I've wanted to meet for a very long time, Michelle Singletary. She's one of the, the nation's leading personal finance columnists and writers uh, for the Washington Post. And so Sarita is going to give us a high-level sort of analysis of the AARP long-term scorecard and the points that we need to consider as we're developing our stories. And Michelle will help us really understand what she has learned and, and her expertise has grown as she's written about the issues that families have to grapple with when it comes to providing long-term care and supports for family members. So we're gonna get started with Sarita, and then we'll uh, be followed by Michelle. Thank you so much. You wanna come up here? Such a great opportunity for me to be here today to be with all of you. Uh, my name is, as mentioned, Sarita Mohanty, and I am the president and CEO of the SCAN Foundation. Um, I think, you know, uh, just really excited because Part of our journey as we support aging and aging in place, aging in community, is really ensuring that we have the right narrative, the right stories, the right um, messages so that we can help shape, inform programs and policies and really advance health equity. So we, you know, before I get started about some of the, I'm going to what I'm going to talk to you about today is about five story ideas worth considering. And I know you have numerous ones that have been brought to your attention over these last few days. And um, I'll just highlight some of the things that also uh, resonate with us at the foundation. So just a little bit about our organization. So we are, um, we've been in existence for a little over 15 years. Uh, we're a uh, independent public charity, 501c3. Uh, we do grant making, and we actually have now started impact investing uh, as through our corpus dollars. And I'll talk a little bit more about that because I think there's some in interesting stories about community level investments um, as well in aging. Uh, our vision, and we envision a society where everyone, all of us, age well with purpose. And so when you think about aging, it is, and I think you probably have heard this over the coming days, last few days, is that it is not just about those that are, you know, certainly we're looking at people who are older, who are potentially over 65. But if you think about it, a person who's homeless or unhoused, sometimes their physiologic age is different from their numerical age, right? So they, uh, if they, there's statistics that show if you look at a 50-year-old unhoused individual, their physiologic age is more than like 70. So you think about those things, but we also think about preparing for aging. So this is a continuum, aging is a continuum. Our mission is we aim to pursue this vision by being what we're describing, we think we're at a critical juncture when we talk about aging, we have to be bold, and we have to take so take risks, and we lead with equity, um, which I'll talk about as well, and so equitable changes in how older adults age in both home and community. Uh, so we're doing very bold, deliberate grant making, bold, deliberate impact investing, and so what I'm gonna do now is just in the brief time I'm here, I will be able to just share with you some um, story ideas. And of course, I welcome your, the conversation. Um, the first story idea that uh, we talk about is the 
Uh, and I think some of you have heard this. I think you've heard about this. And I think in the dinner the first day, there was the discussion about the AARP scorecard. And we have been a, a, a partner with the ARP, with ARP and with Commonwealth Fund, as well as the John A. Hartford Foundation on, on supporting this um, scorecard. And you know, it's the, the story is about the stark differences in care for older adults. And that's what this scorecard um, looks at based on many factors, I think many of you heard, uh, that in, in impact access and quality of home and community-based long-term services and supports. So it's a really helpful barometer. I uh, just want to reiterate that uh, to seeing which states perform well and which ones fall short. And how do, we, how do we get to the level of some of the states like Minnesota, Colorado, Washington, uh, DC, who kind of came up in the ranks? What, what, are the, what were the levers? What were the things that really um, got them to that tier one? And what can other states do? Um, and you know, I think the, the other thing just to mention as we think about the, the scorecard from 2023, it looked at it, the data from the time you know, when COVID really uh, hit us. And it uh, really, really reinforced the, in how the, the gaps were exacerbated in terms of long-term care services and supports. So um, the other th the things I would just like to highlight in the scorecard, which you may have also heard, some of the things were around um, examples that the scorecard reflected was on nursing home uh, quality and staffing. Only 22% of nursing home residents live in a facility with a five-star rating. Home and community-based services, um, we know that many rural states have large numbers of people with low care needs living in nursing homes, indicating a lack of home-based services. And then help for family caregivers. This was also looked at in the scorecard. The average family caregiver, you may have heard, spends more than 7,000 a year, 7,000 a year out of out-of-pocket costs, with out-of-pocket costs. Yet only six states provide a tax credit. Uh, for these expenses. So we are, and our goals, um, objectives at the SCAN Foundation, one of the goals is about Im improving, enhancing aging infrastructure, health infrastructure. And our priority populations really are those of lower income, uh, those at or below the 400% federal poverty limit. So that includes your dual eligibles, Medicare, Medicaid, your near duals, as well as that low middle income um, Medicare, the ones that don't have really any kind of long-term care services available to them. Um, we also are really um, intersecting that with racial social justice, uh, communities of color, and also looking at rural populations as well. So the, this scorecard really helps us as a foundation think about priority areas for us to support and fund some of the um, efforts that are going underway. So if we look at the other um, you know, area, which we talk about is another story, and I think you know, this goes without saying, is that there is an exploding, exploding demand for home-based care. And one of the SCAN Foundation's goals is to ensure financial stability for people to age in place. And there's a lot of momentum. 53% uh, of Medicaid spending on long-term care right now went to home and community-based services. That is up from 30, 37% in 2009. And this is gonna just continue to grow. And again, this is Medicaid. So what again about those lower middle income um, uh, older adults who don't have Medicaid? So that's another challenge that we will continue to reiterate in these conversations. And then we know that the demand for affordable options to age in place far exceeds supply. You know, AARP says that on average nine out of 10 individuals um, older adults want to remain in their current homes as they age. Many can't do so. Uh, we have one in three older adults is economically insecure. That includes more than half of black and Hispanic older adults. And there are few affordable options, especially middle income families. So, you know, and, I, and again, the, the aging in place uh, requires access to service. So if you, people, nine out of 10, want to be in their homes, they need access to services. But challenges are their long wait lists make it nearly impossible to get the help they need. That's one. Shortage of workers. That's another one. And I think you've probably heard time and time again that the workforce challenges are, are continuing to, to escalate. 
And many people therefore rely on piecemeal support. So family caregivers going back to the importance of them, but they're unpaid, most of them, untrained, most of them, and unsupported. So, as, so we'll need to be thinking. So the, again, a, a critical story area for, for all of us. And then the, the third, the next story is really about caregiving. And I, you know, it's, I, we could talk about this area. Uh, I think it's every, everybody in this room has people they know who have been caregivers and, or are, maybe some of you in this room are caregivers. You know, we know that 53 million people in America provide care for a family member or friend and they are not paid for it. They are mostly women. 61%, and they are mostly employed, 61%. They provide 23.7 hours of care a week on average, coupled with the other responsibilities like childcare, work, school, et cetera. Children, and I think this is an important area to really think about, children are also unpaid caregivers for family members, and that's far more common in non-white families. So, you know, when again, it goes back to this intergenerational aspect em emphasis when we think about aging. And that's why as a, as a foundation, we don't talk about a number, an age number. It's really about that continuum and how do you prepare for aging and how do you support those caregivers, whether they're children, you know, th those in the sandwich generation, those ones that are working, taking care of their children um, and their older parents, et cetera. So, Something to really, I think, highlight as we go forward. Family caregivers receive little or, or no support for the care they provide. Most provide help with medical tasks. That's that percentage is 58%, but have no formal training. So I'm an internal medicine physician, and I don't know how many times I've told you, I've seen um, where patients have said and caregivers have said, you know, I'm being asked to flush a pick line for because my, my mom needs you know medicines and I don't know if I'm doing it right I'm scared I shake every time I have to do it because they're not um, they're, they're not trained they're not that's not what they, or they and, and they're they're wondering why they have to do this and it's really hard um, you know some are will, very um, now skilled in it but there's many who that training level and support needs to happen for those caregivers. Uh, we talked about the states, almost no states, six in total provide some level of tax credits for out-of-pocket expenses related to caregiving. Few states have laws protecting caregiving or caregivers from workplace discrimination um, due to caregiving duties outside of work. Um, this is a big area where employers and others are trying to figure out how to support caregivers because they see the impacts on productivity and quality of life for their employees. Um, and nor do most states provide paid time off. This is an, an area you're, we are seeing emerging, but not fast enough. People cannot, they have to, they have to use their, uh, their PTOs, their personal, their, their paid time offs to, to be able to take care of their loved ones. And that is not sustainable. So that is another story. And then the one I will say that is um, also another important story that I think is, um, we're taking at the SCAN Foundation, and I, I really want to emphasize this, the real opportunities. We are, m many people are focused these days, you hear health equity, fair and justice options, uh, ju um, justice and options and care, but we know that it's complex. Health inequity is complex. Um, and we're seeing, and we saw this during the pandemic, in a substantial amount of older adults from communities of color who died during COVID disproportionately and had even more challenges with access to care. So issues of inequities often focus on race, but also, we also, we also um, need to know that there are efforts to improve aging and ability as well, and we m must be including those efforts when we think about achieving social and racial justice. So those, we talk about this intersectionality when we think about the the work on health equity, you know, it's it's you know, it's people of color, older adults are often left out in decision makings. We need to address that, but we also need to think about the LGBTQ population. And the, I was I had the fortunate opportunity at my own board retreat yesterday here in D.C. to meet with an organization that, if you haven't read up on, you should Sage, 
and they do a lot of work on, um, on, a, um, on policies and programs to support older adults who are from the LGBTQI community. So I, I encourage you because they're doing some tremendous work and they're actually partnering with the National Hispanic Council on Aging. So thinking about how we think about the, the Latino population and how we think about the LGBTQ and, and it just, that kind of partnership needs to um, be, I, I think, elevated like, because they're, they're really trying to intersect policy options. And the other thing is, um, and what we're doing, we actually have an advancing health equity and aging initiative starting in California. And what we are doing, and I, I think this is, is we, we've been a foundation that has looked at a lot of data and said, okay, what are the gaps? What are the opportunities? So quantitative, but we firmly believe that it is important to look at the, and, and talk to the people, the, the lived experience doing what we call human-centered design, and even then co-designing solutions. And I think we need to elevate those solutions more, and we also are trying to ensure that we as a foundation are co not coming in with a top-down approach saying, community, you kn we know what your problem is. We're gonna fund you to do this project. We're like, no, community, what is, your, what is the problem or issue that you think is really causing grave inequities in aging? And then what, how, how can we support you in solution? Your, so you could solution those. Your, you know, we call it shared power. That is what we're, we're aiming for. And uh, we are really excited on this journey. We have learned a tremendous amount. One thing I would also suggest if you're interested, uh, we actually, and as, as part of our initiative, we actually, um, we actually uh, contract with an organization called Greater Good Studio. They do human-centered design work, so GGS for short. And if you Google that and, and, our, and the SCAN Foundation, there is a report and some videos about communities of color, people in rural pop populations. They went to the border of Calexico, the, the Calexico, which is the border of California and Mexico, to look at older adults and how they are you know, having challenges with access to care as older adults. And, and I will tell you, these stories are so compelling, and we're using those to elevate um, our narrative around things that need are, are most important around addressing um, health inequities and aging. So. Um, and so that is something I just, I, I, I think there's more and more uh, opportunity to look at things from the community level and see how people at the grassroots are, are really trying to make change, effectuate change. And then, you know, the last thing I will, um, last story, but there's, oh, there's tons. I mean, this is like five, I, I called out five. But um, the last one is we're working with actually other healthcare organizations and foundations to diversify investments. Um, with a focus on social good. So what does that mean? Social impact investing has become increasingly relevant in today's economy. As social and environmental challenges are like the pandemic have become front and center really in our consciousness. And so a major driver of this change um, is our better understanding of health equity and the social determinants of health. And at our foundation, we are actually having a better understanding of how community development can strengthen a region. And that's where social impact investing is coming in. Um, and we wanna enact those changes with those investments in mind. I mean, we're a small, medium-sized foundation, so we can, but we're partnering with others. And we're saying, look, when we wanna do investments in a fund that is supporting caregiving, we wanna make sure that we're really focused on aging, that we're really focusing on, health, on our priority populations and being, a, uh, being a seat at the table to ensure that these investments are being, you know, doing good for folks. And so, I mean, we're seeing some US hospitals and health systems are now funding more and more community health promoting um, investments over charitable contributions. So they're actually going in and making, you know, real investments, um, you know, in addition to grant making. And so we think, we really feel that through impact investing, there could be some real social change as well. And so that's something we have just started at our foundation. And so as you, the, if you look at other foundations, Ford Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, others, they're doing, they've, they've been doing this for a while with bigger dollars. But I, so I encourage you to also look at um, some of the investments and what kind of impacts they're making. And that could be really important stories to tell. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end there. And I uh, really appreciate it. I hope this was helpful. And really, I'm looking forward to the dialogue. So thank you. Michelle, let's join Sarita up yeah. front and continue the conversation. So I thought it would be a tremendous opportunity to have, <clears throat> excuse me, Michelle join us as a journalist 
who knows what it takes to communicate with editors and newsrooms mm -hmm. when it comes to trying to convey the importance of focusing on a particular issue. And so I asked Michelle to think of three or four columns that she's written based on her reporting and her sort of uh, thinking about this that will really um, send them home yeah. with the right energy. So take it away. All right, well, hello. Um, hope if I turn my mic on right. Uh, so I wanted to quickly start that this is really personal to me because I've been a caregiver since I was uh, about 21. My brother uh, had a severe epilepsy, and my grandmother raised all of us. And uh, when I, the day after I graduated from college, my grandmother announced that it was now my time to take care of my brother. And, uh, and I did until he died at 32. So then I had to take care of my grandfather, who developed lung cancer. And I was working for the Baltimore Evening Sun at the time, and my grandmother didn't like driving. She, we lived a little outside of downtown Baltimore, and she didn't like driving down to downtown Baltimore, and my grandfather's chemotherapy was in downtown. So I went to the work at Baltimore Evening Sun, did a little bit of work, left, went to get him, take him to his chemotherapy, wait for him, go back to the newsroom, do some work, go get him, take him back home. And that went on until he passed away. Uh, and then uh, my grandmother, and then finally my father-in-law who came to live with us. Um, and I was his primary caregiver during the day. We hired two people in the morning, uh, one person in the morning, one in the evening. So I've been doing this for a very long time. And so I pulled out a couple of columns because I try to write very personal so that people understand this from a personal level and people kind of resonate with um, personal stories. So one of the columns, the headline was, here's what it's like dealing with the high cost of long-term care. And I'm just going to read a, uh, a little bit of the beginning of the columns for each one. So the first one for this one was, one of my favorite Spock quotes from Star Trek television series is, live long and prosper. Can't do the fingers. <laughs> 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 Who doesn't want to live long, right? Well, what if the longevity means spending down your money for long-term care? And that and that's if you've been prosperous and have the funds to pay a facility or home health care to care for you. I asked readers to share their long-term care experience, and here's what one reader said. My mother had Alzheimer's and was in a men uh, memory unit for two years, uh, wrote Chris Gonzalez from California. My dad had been in assisted living for two and a half years, and for the last two years has needed round-the-clock care. The cost when my mother was alive totaled $230,000 a year. The cost of care for my dad is now $170,000 a year. This is, this is a reader from Fort Smith, Arkansas. Arkansas. And then another reader said, my mother died two years ago. For the last two years of her life, she had progressively worsening dementia. We, we, mainly me and my sister, arranged for her to be cared for at her home. The cost was running in at about $85,000 a year. That was in 2018. And then I wrote another column about, there's a looming long-term care crisis. Are you prepared? And I wanted to try to focus on those who are getting care. And this is the top of that column. We often talk about the significance of cost of long-term care, but there's something else to consider. Live long enough, many of us will see our 90s, and you're likely to need help with basic activities such as eating, dressing, and bathing. The cost of this care could decimate your retirement savings. The annual medium cost of the stay at that time when I wrote this column was, for a nursing home was over $100,000. And for a home health aid, about $50,000 a year. But most long-term care services are provided by unpaid family members and friends. My question to you, are you equipped emotionally to accept the caregiving you may need? In September, I tripped some, down some stairs in my home and broke my ankle in two places. For a, few week, for a few weeks, I couldn't put any weight on my foot. Walking on crutches was so painful that I had to use a wheelchair. Even going to the bathroom was difficult. Why a taller seat so low? It was humiliating and humbling. Within the first days of my accident, I fell again. 
because I refused to ask for help to navigate to the toilet. I wasn't all prepared for how vulnerable I would feel because I had to rely so heavily on others. And this was a two-part column because this was addressing the people who are gonna get care. And I think Sarita talked about how so many people want to age in their home and they just can't. And the struggle families have to say you can't do it. And that incident for me, and I know I look 29, but that was, <laughs> that was like in my early 50s and I'm thinking I'm one of those people. I can't ask for help. What am I going to do when I need even more help? And the last column, tough questions about long-term care insurance. I wasn't sure what to tell them, any of them. A Silver Spring, Maryland couple, the husband is 84 and the wife is about to turn 79, were distraught. They had received notice that the premiums for their long-term care insurance bought on the private market are rising to the point where they can no longer afford it. And that when I, I talk about some story ideas, we sort of think that that's the answer, but it's not the complete answer. The, in this case, their policies were going up. They originally started paying about $4,000 a year, and now they're going to be paying close to $8,000. And um, I wrote about another couple who was getting federal insurance, uh, long-term care insurance from the federal government. And their policy increases were going to be about 70 to 80%. And the husband said, we thought we were doing the right thing. <laughs> you talk to these people, it, it runs deep. They made the premium so cost prohibitive, we may have no alternative than to let the policy lapse. That's what we're dealing with. And that's how you have to write it so that we and people take notice, your readers take notice. Uh, and this is such an important issue. And I think Sarita said that if you are not a caregiver now, you will be, or you will be on the receiving end of caregiving. And that's how you should approach it when you write this. This isn't not about people, other people, it's about you. You know, you powerfully led into the very next question I was gonna ask you which was, we've heard several times over the past few days about what people think about long-term care insurance. For some reason, many people feel that Medicare is gonna cover all of that. So if you were to give these journalists an idea of the story that they could report on long-term care insurance, what would you, how would you suggest? So the way we report on long-term care insurance is we interview financial advisors and they all say that you should get it when you're around 50. Now some even say you should start getting it in your 20s and 30s so that it's more affordable. But if you get a long-term policy when you're 20 and 30s, and we know that most people who end up using it are in their 70s, you can imagine what that's gonna cost over the years. And that's usually how we cover it. But long-term care industry, uh, insurance industry has gone through a crazy cycle. When they first introduced the policies, they thought, we, this is a cash cow. These people are going to die. They're going to have a policy for a couple of years. We're going to be, we're going to be sitting pretty. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what happened? <laughs> Medical research, mm -hmm. the elongating of people's lives. So the, and they sold policies that had no end. So you could have it for your life. And so people became ill in their late 60s and 70s, and they lived to their 90s. Mm -hmm. And then the insurance company, they go, oh, we missed, we, we did not see this coming. And so then they started selling, they continued to sell policies until they couldn't anymore. Uh, in fact, the federal government's, their long-term policy, you can't even get a new policy. They stopped it in 2022 because it was unsustainable. And so now they have hybrid policies and they have limits. Um, most of the policies, the top policy will pay out probably about two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars, or five years, whichever comes first. Well, if you going, you know, and the thing about all timers, which of course you can speak to more than me, is that you you live, you can live very long with all timers, um, and so that two hundred or three hundred thousand is gone in a couple of years. 
And so we need to talk about what is the alternative because it is not financially stable. The thing about it is if you don't have any money, you shouldn't get a policy because you can't keep the premiums. If you are well off, you don't really need it. You probably could self-insure. It's that middle group of people who won't qualify for Medicaid and is not covered by Medicare. They have just enough money to hold on for a couple of years. And so that is the small swath of people who, for whom long-term care insurance will, is worth it. But the way we write it, not me, and probably not y'all, hopefully, <laughs> is that everybody should get it. Well, that's just not true. And so if long-term care insurance is not the answer, then what is the answer? And it has to be a policy change on the state and federal level. And I don't know if you guys look, uh, some of y'all look like I got shoes older than y'all. But when the, bond, when the Affordable Care Act was introduced, there was actually a very key component of that called the Class Act, which I thought was kind of interesting because yeah. it was, you know, and it was shot down almost on arrival. And it was actually supposed to be self-funded, so people paid into it, but they realized that that wasn't necessarily sustainable because who's gonna buy it? The people who are gonna need it and they're gonna run out of money. And so the answer is both a combination of perhaps some long-term care insurance, but also, and we don't wanna say this, and we understand why, because we just look what happened in Congress recently, that on an individual level, we have to have a way to afford long-term care and the government help with that. No. You're setting me up brilliantly for this discussion <laughs> because my next question was to Sarita. Mm -hmm. When it comes to um, discussions about these topics, a lot of people sort of reach a bottom line of the government ought to do more. Mm -hmm. And we know, of course, that the innovation is occurring on the state level because there's so much gridlock at the federal level and it gets down to competing interests. Uh, it may make common sense to treat people humanely, but there's an industry out there somewhere who says it's going to take money out of our pockets. So as you're having these conversations and moving in these circles, um, are we just out of luck when it comes to trying to move the needle at the federal level? Uh, um, well, I'm going to try to be the optimist today and say that uh, I th there is, I think, we believe that there, there are opportunities to, to influence the, at the federal level. To your point, it is um, right now, they are not leading that charge, um, but it's still, a, a, it behooves us, it's, it's, it's our responsibility to continue to beat that drum and talk about the, the needs and the, all the things you, you mentioned, Michelle. I mean, it is, and so what I would say is, when right now, especially you know, in our polarized kind of what's going on in, in the political scene, right now uh, I would say that we are saying, okay, well, states are taking on some really innovative efforts and approaches. Uh, you know, when we think about long-term care insurance for that missing middle or forgotten middle population, Washington State, for example, has taken on some payroll tax options, and there's other uh, California's right now evaluating actuarial approaches to doing some kind of long-term care, maybe buy-in, so that's to be determined. But I think we have to start at the state level. One of the things that at the SCAN Foundation we have been working on with other foundations and other par multi-stakeholder partners is uh, this multi-sector plan for aging. And we think this is a real opportunity where states can actually create a blueprint for what's most important in aging infrastructure and um, and you know that that continuum of, of needs of aging, right? That 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 every state should build. And the common themes, the goals, often are the ones that are not any surprise to any of you: housing, transportation, caregiving. Um, you know, just having a one uh, no wrong door, one stop shop. So when a person has to figure out where to go to get services, they don't have to talk to 50 different people. So that M that MPA, I'll call it for short, is really we think a real um, important focus that states, and I will tell you, so I have a, you know, we work in both California and nationally, but California really took a lead on developing their 10-year bl blueprint, this MPA. And now we are seeing states across the country are, are starting to build their own MPAs, which I think is a great testament to the fact, and, and uh, to, of the needs that, and, and addressing these concerns. And 
we are seeing people in the Senate also interested in a potentially national MPA. So the government is paying attention, but it took a little time, right, to start to build the momentum. And usually, sometimes it's at the state level. So we think that's the approach we can take. And um, and um, I'm not giving up hope that these are, there are things that can be uh, brought, to, continue to be brought to attention to the to the federal. I think between ones. you and I, Jen Poo, we're getting some really strong optimism in this <laughs> workshop. Journalists, we're being told as journalists that. Um, the picture is not necessarily all bleak. But I want to come back to you, Michelle, because, again, as a, someone who's been in newsrooms, you know that an effective way to get things across to editors sometimes is to say, did you know that the average long-term care insurance policy costs $1,000 a month or whatever? So give us some tools for ways maybe to, to uh, pull out data or numbers that will make an editor go, Wow, okay, yeah, do that story. Uh, <laughs> or is there, well, no, really, is there a way to, to quantify the average cost of a long-term care policy? So, you said this is being recorded, right? <laughs> okay. Don't say nothing you don't, don't want the whole world to hear. Don't say nothing that I want the whole world to say. I will say that it is a hard sell for many newsrooms to talk about this. And I'll tell you why. Because they are having a difficult time with their revenue. And so they are looking for stories that will bring in, right now there's a, a, a focus on younger uh, folks and subscribers. So you say retirement and long-term care, and they're like, oh, that's not gonna, that's not gonna be what we are going to. Uh, so uh, you're going to have to figure out a way to look at where they are trying to get new subscribers and pitch the story that way. That's just real, y'all. That's just real. Um, because every time I write about retirement, it's, you know, there's all clicks and users and all that kind of stuff. It just blows up. But I can't seem to get them to see that that is where we have to be. Because who's going to pay for a subscription? Old people. Because my daughter's 28, and, and she lives in my house and eats my food. <laughs> and she doesn't want to read the post. Um, and so, it's real. So I think the more salacious, the more you can talk about misdeeds, that kind of thing, that is how you're going to get the interest. Like um, Christopher, uh, Christopher, who from the Post, Roland. Roland, who I know was spoken to you, he did a wonderful, uh, some columns about people being kicked out of nursing homes um, when they hit that level for Medicaid. That's the kind of stuff. And then what you can do is sneak in other parts that talk about the things that um, we, she was talking about today, the statistics. They don't want to hear that. So the more salacious, the more interesting, the more deep dive you do, then I think deep reads, um, I think that is going to get their attention. Um, you use the stats to legitimize what you're writing, but you can't lead with that. I am fascinated by what she talked about this just now. You know, one out of five and all that, I'm just like, Go, but I can't take that like that to my editor. I've got to do the personal. They love the one about me on the toilet. Let's like, you know, <laughs> and, and people loved it because it was kind of real. And so I think that's how you're going to have to get your newsrooms to get you to do these kinds of stories. So in other words, what you may be saying is, if there's a way to find out if there's a family whose basically lives were destroyed because they had didn't have long-term care insurance. So I would imagine then the good way to do that might be to find some uh, Facebook groups or hmm. conversations where people are talking about the cost of care, follow the, the conversational threads, and maybe reach out to some of these people. That's, That's a, exactly right. I mean, we, in journalism, we have always loved the personal anecdote story I didn't say that right. I always say that. Miss Anecdote. I know. It's like, I'm from Baltimore, y'all. Y'all know what I meant. I feel <laughs> um, But that, that is the way to get into this topic with real people. But even a deeper dive, because often what you'll do is you'll have one um, story at the top. You know, Marjorie had to take care of her mother when she's 80. And then you get into all the other, you know, uh, drone kind of uh, copy. But you got to take Marjorie all the way through 
You know, what is it like for her? What is it like for her, for her mom? You know, um, the struggle. The Post actually had a wonderful story about um, a caregiver whose dad just refused to leave his house and how she had to leave a job and to take care of him and the struggle. Fascinating story. And, but, but, you know, within it, I wouldn't say buried, but, you know, throughout it were the statistics, but just follow it all the way through with some beautiful pictures of him and, you know, why he doesn't want to leave. Uh, and I think that's kind of how you have to do it. Before we open it up to questions, I wanted to ask Sarita about the issue of um, Gen Z caregiving and millenni younger, because yeah. I think we do kind of silo and think about, you know, older folks taking care of their parents or whatever. So. Uh, in, within, once again, foundation circles, uh, is that a way perhaps to build momentum in communities by, by highlighting the fact that younger people are having to deal with this as well? I, I, I absolutely agree with that statement. I mean, it is exactly, I think, the approach when you're thinking about your stories. It's, I think what you were mentioning, think about it. Who is it affecting and where, like, it, and like I mentioned earlier, you know, children are often caregivers of their grandparents or parents, right? And 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 so it is it is really important, I think, in a couple couple areas, I think, where there's there's opportunity. One is um, there's a lot of work going underway now to how to um, in, build intergenerational communities between older adults and younger, you know, the millennial, Gen Zs, et cetera, because um, uh, because right now, uh, you know, for example, a lot of older adults, you know, retire are retiring, but they still need to work, and or they need to have purpose and they want to do other things. They can they they're going in volunteering in K through 12 schools to to help um, you know educate and, and inform younger kids and vice versa. Um, there's there's also um, examples of um, college kids who are can afford rent when they're going to college and they're, 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 they're renting a house, very um, small amount of rent or you know, little rent, um, and an, somebody who's living alone. So that, per, that older adult who's socially isolated now has somebody in the home who can help them with some of their activities of daily living, reduce rent, and there's, there's bond and connection. So there, there are so many um, aspects of ways where we, we need to build, talk about this community work much more um, intentionally. Uh, I would say the, and, and, and the intergenerational, two, uh, one couple things I will say is one, um, if you haven't, there's another, there's an organization called Cogenerate or Encore.org, um, Eunice Nichols and Mark Friedman, and they are doing some great work with AmeriCorps and other things to think about this intergenerational approach to helping support older adults. So there's some really good stories, and I think one of the things I would say is we, we there's a lot of the, you know, you said it's hard for people to read the negative because they get like, I don't want to hear about this. This is too much for me. Is there other ways to show, start with, here's some examples of things that work, and how do we now amplify that? How do we scale those solutions? Um, because we need more of that. So having those kind of examples. The other thing I'll just say is when we're doing community level work for older adults, like I mentioned, our advancing health equity and aging, we are actually saying it's not just older adults that are coming to the, the community work. It's going to be all generations who participate in that, so those solutions. Let's open it up at this point, Art. Are there any questions out here? This one right here? Yeah, we're waiting for the microphone. Oh. Hi, I'm Jesse with CQ Roll Call. Um, Michelle, I was wondering if you could talk more about how you find people to talk to and how do you um, gain their trust so they're willing to talk to you? Yeah. Uh, I have no problem finding real people because I am uh, very involved in my community. I run a financial program um, at my church. Um, it's a year-long program, um, and every year we enroll like 200 people to go through, and I have a monthly workshop where I talk about finances. Um, so, uh, and through that, that's 200 people right there, and of those 200, probably 80% of them either are a caregiver or have some caregiver situations. So you, I think you need to embed yourself in the community. Um, it, 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 I think sometimes when reporters sort of just drop in, they'll ask for, for people, um, 
and then they don't really know anything about the organizations. They, you know, you know, you go to church, you go to community groups, you, you know, or whatever you're doing. If you're working out, I mean, I, I do aqua spin, and there's like a whole bunch of old ladies, <laughs> and so I'm listening to them. And I, in fact, I had a, it was a funny conversation. We were in the dressing room, and um, the women were talking about how they come, they come to the pool every day, and one of the women's daughters was like, "Why are you just, why are you out here in the morning at 6 a.m.?" and and I heard them laugh, she's like, like, she my parent, you know? <laughs> and so if I was gonna do a story about that, there it is right there. Mm -hmm. um, and I've built up a, um, a relationship with them so they feel more comfortable um, sharing their story. Uh, and so you really need to be at meetings and figure out what's going on and who to talk to. And don't just wait till you do the story to call someone from AARP and say, hey, can you give me a person? Um, and I think when you, because when you do that, they are more willing to share more details with you. And it's the details that make that story sing. Can I just add a follow up? Sorry. Um, how do you, like, because I've thought about doing this, but I kind of feel some discomfort with, like, inserting myself into a space where I might not be welcome, like, as a reporter. Or, um, like, what kind of space? What do you mean? Um, I don't know. Like, um, like volunteering, because I have thought about, like, oh, I could volunteer and do respite care, because it's something I gen genuinely want to do. Mm -hmm. um, not because of, like, oh, I think I'll find some good sources this way, but because I think, like, it could be really helpful. Um, but if I feel like I would feel uncomfortable, like, if I did find a story that way, with approaching them being like, oh, I'm also a journalist. And, you know, does that make sense? It does make sense. How old are you? Just curious. 31. OK. So back in the day, columnists was at the bar. They were at the police station. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, so you shouldn't feel that way at all. And, you know, if you are embedded in you, that's something that your, is your heart desire. When you come to them and say you want to do a story, then they know that you're legit. Right, because you've been volunteering, you've been there. And I think you actually get better stories that way. And if people don't want to talk to you, they'll say, no, nah, I don't want to talk to you. So don't count yourself out from that rich environment. And how much more informed your stories will be when you actually know how this thing works. When I, work, when I write about long-term care, I know how this thing works. I had to hire caregivers. I had to negotiate them. I had to get rid of bad ones. You know, so yes, embed yourself. If that is something you want to do in your private life, do that. And from that, you will get such rich stories. I mean, I write about stuff that I encounter all the time. And I never write about anybody, and I always tell my friends, because they're always like, you know, don't write about this. But my agreement with everybody, including my family members, is that I will not write about it unless I have your um, yeah. you know, permission. And oftentimes I will, because they are not sophisticated, I will actually read to them what I'm writing so that they know what I'm about to say. I did a story about, um, this is not directly with long-term care, but my, my sister, she much older than me. <laughs> she was almost a, a victim of a social security scam. She was at work. I get this call. She's on the call. She calls me. I get on the phone with her and the scammer. And I, and I like, on the side, I said, Lee, I got, this is a column girl. And I started recording us talking to the scammer. And that became one of the most popular columns I wrote. And I said, is it OK if I do this? And because I have a relationship, and then it happened to be my sister. So if you have a relationship with people, and you can just honestly say, I need to tell this story. People need to know what you're going through. And you'd be surprised how many people will step up and say, yeah, let's tell this story. Thank okay. you. Over here. Hey there, my name is Kathy Ritchie and I'm with KJZZ in Phoenix. You know, the long-term care insurance piece has been on my mind a lot because I've ha I have it. My husband and I got it before our daughter was born because my mother had FTD. So I'm like, oh my God, I don't want in knowing the cost. Um, but I think about Arizona and where you have like one of the fastest growth rates of Alzheimer's, yet people still come to Arizona. They want to they want to retire there. Um, it's also becoming quite expensive to live in the Phoenix area. Thinking about the story of long-term care insurance and the Washington state model, 
like I've been kind of mulling that story. I don't know, you know, and I have a lot of flexibility with my editors, which is great. I just don't have a lot of time because it's like radio. Um, how to tell that story of like, what is long-term care insurance? Could Arizona develop a model? And is the Washington insurance model like working? Cause I didn't think it was that much money that you would be putting into with this payroll tax. So, I mean, I, so it's multi, it's a lot. And also thank you so much for all your, for both. This has been super helpful. I really enjoyed this session. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'll just, I'll start. And I'll just say that, you know, I, I agree that the, 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 Washington model was a start that wasn't perfect. I mean, even payroll tax, you have to have a payroll. You have to be working to get, so other, you know, so there were certain people that were left out of that, um, didn't cross state lines. I mean, there's a lot of things that, you know, weren't perfect. But I think there are um, opportunities to, to learn from, you know, how much savings. It's not a lot, but it, at least it's, it's some opportunity to have some dollars if you need, if you have a catastrophic event or you need some personal care attendant assistance. Um, so I think it's still um, being evaluated. Um, I think other states are looking at other models. Hawaii, I believe. I think Minnesota. There's other ones, and we're we actually quite honestly, I don't. We also want to, as a foundation, want to look at those more closely and see what's what's working and what's not. So a little more to be determined. But I think there's some ways to maybe delve in and say, let's let's get a little. You know, maybe as as journalists to be able to get a little insight into how people are utilizing that. It's like solutions yeah. piece the that solutions you, piece. Yeah, yeah which yeah. I find, yeah. just for my own sanity when I do this work, is so important to try and include when I can. And mm -hmm. is this yeah. a solution that's viable, maybe? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Michelle, what are your thoughts with the long-term care insurance? And by the way, mine is, mine is like, like forever. I had one of the last policies. But the premiums mm -hmm. are getting expensive. Yeah, so with those forever policies, um, so by, uh, by state rules, so what they sold you on was that your policy will never increase, which is not quite true. Well, actually, it's just not true. Because they can increase it for the group. Uh, and so I don't know what you're paying for now, but it's going to increase. It's several hundred dollars a month. Several, hun several hundred. And, and I think it's like well, $300 a month, right? Yeah. My husband is more because he's older than me. Right. And I, I think about... I think about not... You know, like I, I was calling him after I think yesterday's session of like, is this where we, how we want to do this? But then when you've been invested in it for like 10 years, yeah, because yeah. that's what we, you know, I'm like, I don't want my daughter to go through what I went through. Right. I want to make sure that I'm taking care of if I, it's a genetic dementia. But at the same time, like maybe I could make better choices with this three hundred dollars a month or right. whatever it is now. It's really tough. You're in a unique position. So how would you tell that story? So if you you not all of you are in a position to tell it from a first person. I can because I'm a columnist. So you might find other people, maybe the insurance agents who sold you that policy. You can ask for other customers who have. That'd be actually a great story. The last person who had the forever yeah. policy. I mean, I might be able to tell it from my own if I got permission from my editor. Because I was thinking about that, like, do I? Keep, I'm 46. Do I keep it? What do I do? It's that, a lot of money, money. girl. Yeah. That segment right there. You just you just wrote your segment. <laughs> I mean, that seriously. Like, you're 46. You probably are going to use new. Maybe you look pretty. You're very nice looking. You slim. And <laughs> I mean, I think you're going to be going to your 70s. I'm 29 so. like you. <laughs> So you're a lot healthier. I'm sitting up on this stool trying to think, where am I? But nothing on this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so potentially at your age, you're talking another 30 years, right? And so say it like that, just what you just said. I got this policy when I was X, and I'm looking at 30 years, and it's 300 now. What is it going to be when you're 60? Because remember, they can increase it for the group. So we prob your policy probably be a thousand dollars a month, mm. yeah. You know, mm -hmm. easily. Now, whether you should keep it or not, that I, I you know, <laughs> ask the doc here, because <laughs> you know that's yeah. the question, and you can actually start the segment off of that because you know I'm, I have a master's degree in business, and things like sunken costs. That's how they get you. Mm -hmm. You put so much in, and you don't want to lose that money, and so now you keep paying money. Um, but can you self-insure? And so maybe the decision for you is how are you investing so that perhaps you can take that 300 and invest it and save it. But again, you got one of those gold policies. So 
I don't know what I don't actually know what I would advise you to do. My husband and I decided to self-insure mm -hmm. uh, because we are really good savers, and because of the time that we decided to buy that they didn't have the Cadillac plans, and so the top amount that we would get is about three hundred thousand dollars. Well, I'm not. Y'all need to turn this camera off. I don't know about how much money I had. But, <laughs> but we have enough to do that. So from our perspective, why give them all that money for 20, 30 years? We could take that and invest it because yeah. we're going to have what that policy will pay out. You're a different animal, and that is your story. Because there are a lot of people who have, still have those Cadillac plans and are in that exact position right now. Do I keep it? And if I let it go? They're not writing these policies no more. Mm -mm. But can I, can I afford a $1,000 premium by the time I'm 60? And what that's, if I can't? Yeah, that's exactly it. And you yeah. just end it right there, and everybody be like, dang, the end. Yeah. I better exercise more. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I do. I'm like, I got to get out for 10 minutes at least. Yeah. Yeah. I, I encourage you to ask your editor if you can do it that way, because if nothing else, NPR headquarters would could, would probably jump on that piece too. So if if you can do it locally, that's fine. But I'm pretty confident you could find someone here in DC who want that. And then you brought it out from the personal by using. I mean, I would just talk to this lady right here, and then you can take it. You can start with you, and then take it out, and it isn't as personal. I mean, I would take the personal all the way to the end because I'm a columnist. But you could start with just your indecision and what do you do, and the history in your family. So compelling, so compelling. Yeah. Now you see why I, I've been wanting to meet this woman for a Yeah, I know. <laughs> can, can I just add, like, I mean, I'm just thinking as now as a, as a physician, too, in the clinic. I will tell you, physicians don't even understand what, like, in your example or, you know, an, another person, like, what, serv what op options, what finances they have, long-term care. I think there's, a, there's also a piece there about, like, mm -hmm. you know, that disconnect between somebody who's caring for your medical care and also like what happens when they need services in the home and community. I think there's a lot, I don't know, I feel like just what you were saying, I was thinking about like, I don't, there's a lack of awareness and I could feel like the, the, the medical industry or medical workforce would really benefit from stories like this. I think, the, I think there's a lot of power in what you, you mentioned, Michelle, in your story for sure. Yeah. We are running out of time, but we will take one more if there's a burning question. I'll make it fast. I'm Nina Keck with Vermont Public, and I wanted to dig into something that you mentioned about the rise of the middle income, mm -hmm. older middle income folks yep. that are kind of screwed. Yeah. Um, you talked about intergenerational communities, and can you give any examples of that, maybe in Europe or in the states where, you know, we have, in Vermont, we have the home share, we can get yeah. the college kid, that's pretty common, um, but the intergenerational might be the only thing our state can afford. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, and I, I encourage you, one thing I should mention in this, this growing middle income, older adult population, there's some, there's some really um, um, important data that came out of the University of Chicago NORC uh, study that we actually helped commission, and we also did some work at the state level in California with West Health, um, I think spoke here as well, um, and Shelley Leifert, and so there's some really great work um, about that population, it's getting larger, it's getting more diverse, and three quarters of them, you know, cannot afford any kind of long-term care, you know, um, assisted living, anything, right, at this stage. I mean, and, and they have, these, a lot of people have houses, that's, you know, and they, and if, even if they sell their house, they're still not going to be able to afford, and then where do they go, of course. But to, to your question about intergenerational, I, um, they're, they're, I think in Europe, you're seeing a lot of more models where there are these intergenerational communities, where they're living together, they're supporting one another. It's a cultural change in our society. I mean, I don't know how else to describe it. Like, we have to transform the way we think about community and how we think about supporting a person in our community. Like, and that's in Europe, and I mean, as an example, I think I might, one of my board members lives, you know, lives part-time in the Netherlands, and she's just like, it is a given that if you, have, if you have an older adult, first of all, they have a lot of ways to get around. They have transportation. They're biking everywhere. So communities are built. But also, if an older adult is living alone, that's not acceptable. Somebody will come to their home. They will have a volunteer model where kids and younger adults 
that is what needs to happen. And I don't like I know they're starting to emerge in in the, you know in the United States, but I think we have to keep on showcasing those examples and say this is what's going to need to happen to support yeah. people. I I don't know how else to describe it other than it's a, it's going to be a big cultural. What she need. just said yeah. is worth so many stories, and yeah. I hate how we in America talk about when you leave college, you you should just get out there, yeah. um, and you know, and we tell young people, oh, go just explore yourself. So go move to a city where you have no resources, and you're leaving your parents, and they can't fly to you because they're not going to get on no plane, and you don't want to come down because you're at happy <laughs> yeah, hour. Yeah, yeah. And all three of my young adults are living with us on purpose. They I don't have any college loan debt. And when I was taking care of my father-in-law, I made sure that they went in there and they knew how to bathe him. And they like, Ugh. it's like, you can just go in there. I, I saw my husband's father's stuff that I should never see again. <laughs> I couldn't, anyway, that's too <laughs> TMI. <laughs> but we need, to, we need to change our culture and, and more stories. We talk about that. You know, I am an advocate for encouraging young adults to stay at home, to mm -hmm. stay in the town where they live, yep. to figure it out. I just talked to a young woman who's studying in Boston. Her family's in New Orleans, and she's like, well, I want to stay in Boston. You don't have no resources there. It costs a fortune. You can live with your parents. They're getting older. You can see what's happening. You know, we need to change that. And we are so selfish in America. <laughs> I mean, and I, you know, I, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I tell my kids, I had you so you could take care of me when I'm old. What else, what other reason did I have you? It used to be you had kids <laughs> to farm, right? You needed kids to farm. I said, listen, otherwise I would have just got a dog. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> so we have been training them, and now I have to get therapy to make sure they like me so they'll take care of me. Uh, but I'm a huge advocate of this, and I'm, a, I'm one of the lone voices. Every time I'm on CNN, uh, if you hear the host, they'll say, I know she about to say, stay at home and live with your parents. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Because it's, and this is to her point, the government can't do it all. Yeah. And so we have to assume the responsibility that we are going to have to take care of each other. You're going to have to take care of your parents. You know, they're going to, you know, they could be helping you take care of your kids so you don't have to pay so much for daycare. We have to adopt that model because what we have right now is not sustainable. Right. And we need to have more therapists because in order for that to happen, we're going to have to have people in therapy so you can actually like living with your parents and you like with li living with them. <laughs> That's why I still have a therapist and I go every other month so I cannot kill my 20-year-old kids. Real stuff, y'all. <laughs> uh, anyway, I went off the rail. I'm sorry, Rachel. <laughs> Story and be passionate about I it. Agree. It can't be just a one off. Look at Vermont and the college students live with the old people. No, where are their kids? Where are their nieces and nephews? Yeah. Come on, people. The gut we know they don't even want to pay for Social Security. How are we going to get them to pay for long term care? But if we build a system where they don't have to cover everything, then it may be more palatable to, to those crazy politicians who only care about themselves. We have one of the richest Congress in the world um, we've ever had. So they don't have to worry about this. And because it's not personal to them, it's not personal to the American people for them mm -hmm. to develop policies that, to help the people who are not as wealthy as they are. Let the church yeah. say amen. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And Rachel, Rachel, this session goes to noon, actually. So you can take more questions oh. if you'd like. If there are already others. You can just keep monologuing. Yeah, I was going to oh, yeah, say. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, no, you have to be giving me a mic. You know how we go to church, they say, don't give a visiting <laughs> preacher a mic, Lord. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Sarah Luderman from the 19th. Um, I guess I, I feel like I, in a lot of ways, like children are, are like a big part of our welfare system for, for older adults. But I feel like, especially as like a member of the LGBTQ community, like a lot of my friends are not having kids. Yeah. A lot of my straight friends are also like, you know, increasingly child free. I think that's like a big thing for millennials. So I guess I'm like, I don't know, I'm concerned about where that's going, but then like, I don't want to be like, Oh, you have to have kids. You know, like yeah. it's like it's 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 complicated. Yeah. So I guess like I'm curious about how you think like people are going to be able to navigate that, or if they're going to be able to navigate that. That's such a great story. Write mm -hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. 
what, and then talk to professionals and, and people who are in the field about how do you deal with that. Um, and, and just for me, when I write stuff, I like to give actionable things for my readers. So I'm not just going to write, oh, you know, these folks don't have kids, so what are they going to do? I want to say, how do they navigate this system? And it could be that you're going to develop a different community of friends mm -hmm. and, um, you know, better relationships within the community. So there is this bond. There's people looking out for each other. Because you don't have to be in that community. You could be a widow or someone whose kids may be passed on before them or, or you know, quite frankly, don't want to take care of them. So I think that's a wonderful story to write about what, what, how do they cope with this system that requires caregivers to make it work. Here's another one. Hi, uh, Andy Richards, NJ Advanced Media. Um, so NJ, New Jersey, uh, where I live, um, Sarita, is it yes, Sarita? Right. There are no sidewalks. Yeah, I'm telling you. So, right there, community, the actual yeah, yeah. physical environment, there is no way to navigate. I was thinking, oh, good exercise, I can walk to Starbucks and back, but I can't because the, the sidewalk doesn't extend to where I would have to go. So, I think that's a huge issue. I, I agree, and then if you talk to people in, you know, and you, you know, interview older adults, eight people who are aging, that transportation is one of the biggest concerns that comes up when they're, even when talking about this uh, multi-sector plan for aging, when they brought stakeholders together, always one of the top issues, transportation, walkable environments, um, safety. I mean, you know, it is, it is, it is, and that's, I think, part of the build that needs to happen. At, at, and what I will also say is that when we think about these like MPAs that I mentioned earlier, you gotta look at it at the local community level as well as the state level and then hopefully at the national level there's some mandates about how to make sure that we have these community. I, I mean, I, I think there's, there's efforts but it's slow. And I, I agree with you that we have to, and that's a story in itself. I've seen, yeah. I've seen people like, you know, walking and you know, and, and and you know, you see people who have been hit. I won't start talking about the scooters mm -hmm. that are hitting people across. You know, there's a lot of things going on that that I think um, need to be highlighted. I mean, that's Thank a great you. story, right? Yeah. yeah For those I think of you in the visual medium and even radio, just spend a day with a senior trying to navigate to just walk and get to things and get to their doctor's appointments. Yeah. What a powerful story that is. Just and if you're in television, yeah. just film it yeah. and just show. I mean, when I fell and broke my ankle, I did not realize how just navigating. I mean, I, I, mean, I joked about the toilet, but that, was, that consumed me for several days. And we had to get a toilet list. I mean, it just we're not equipped yeah. to handle people who can't walk and talk and do the things that we take for granted. Yeah. So that, I think that would be just such a you know, a powerful story, even for radio. Yeah. Hi, my question's more for Sarita. My name is Whitney Downard. I'm with the Indiana Capital Chronicle. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that you helped a lot with developing the scorecard and the criteria and the number crunching, but you know, when I read the report, one of the things I noted was how you were like, there's so little data when it comes to demographics. You know, we really, I think this, you guys said this was the first scorecard where you could actually do race, demographics, but there's nothing on income or being gay or anything like that. So can you kind of talk to me a little yeah. bit about these missing demographics and what needs to happen so that way we can actually determine, you know, how many LGBTQ adults are there out there who are stumbling through this broken system? Yeah, so I, I think, and I think you heard a little bit about this on, I think, day one, uh, where they were talking about the scorecard and Susan Reinhardt, who's been leading this effort at ARP, um, Public Policy Institute. This is a, this is the, and we think about the next iteration of the scorecard. There is going to be clear intentionality to try to see how we can capture more of those data. Of course, 
it depends on how you get how the data is collected at the levels of the systems, right? And um, and so there's we're seeing more incentives or more requirements at the federal and the state level to collect more, you know, SOGI data, more, you know, data on um, on race, ethnicity, income, getting it, making sure it's more accurate. It's so I, I agree with you. This is going to be a journey that we're we're on. I don't. I, I think. Um, we just have to keep on um, reinforcing that need of data and consistent data. I mean, health plans have data, they're starting to collect, but it's again, um, you know, it's, we always say garbage in, garbage out, like how, how accurate is it, you know? So it's, you always have to take these with grain of salt, but we've made progress. So I mean, at least I, again, I'm gonna read my, put my little optimism hat on. Like, at least we got the, some of this race ethnicity data in for this scorecard. I, our anticipation, our hope, and you know, is to try to see how we can get more cleaner data to support some of these other demographic factors. So I think it's a really important call out. And uh, and you know, of course, now I won't go into the whole AI. You probably heard all of this, but no, I want to hear it. Yeah, well, that's I mean, question. that's a whole conversation. <laughs> well, and I'll just be brief because it's one of the areas um, we're actually interested in at the foundation when we're working on advancing health equity and aging. One of the areas is data equity, and right now what we're seeing is significant algorithmic bias in, in, in AI and machine learning. So what's happening is when we're thinking about older adults and our priority populations, they are not, you know, the models are, are not capturing the, the race, ethnicity, the other factors that, you know, income, et cetera, that are, are even age properly or even the aging um, perspectives in, in the models. So you know, people and systems, health systems are like a great example. There's an article and I have to find the name, but there's one where they did a study and found that they were trying to figure out a care coordination model for um, older adults or for adults. And they actually um, use utilization as a proxy. So healthcare utilization. So they actually, in the end, offered care coordination to white patients versus black because black people, the black folks in that system were they typically tend to be under utilizers of healthcare so as a result that data was negatively influencing or impacting the, the non non white um, particularly in this case, African American black um, population. So there are a lot of stuff we have to we have to be really careful about. So that's one of the things um, we're trying to. How do we reduce some of that algorithmic bias? How are we including more data into those models because it's running rampant and it's exponentially. Um, these models are growing. So. I'm going to ask my last question for, to both of you, and we've had several discussions over the days about the long term care workforce. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, my position is, is that it's seen as this sort of inexhaustible supply of black and brown women. And so you can pay them a little bit of money because there's 40 people behind them who will come in after you, you abuse or burn out the, the one you have. So I'm, I'm most fasc fascinated about efforts to professionalize, to provide people in the long-term care industry the ability to see a career for themselves mm -hmm. and and build their expertise in ways that helps them support their own families. And I'd love to hear both of your thoughts about the need to make that happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, I think that's a really a good idea. Um, I, I think it's really difficult. There is such a huge shortage of people who want to go into this work. If we did offer a professional path, um, where there are better benefits and, and um, you know, better training, um, then people might choose it. But I'm just going to be honest with you, it's a hard job. It's a hard, hard job. And, you know, I think if we perhaps started at the college level, maybe, with coursework, um, maybe a degree or something, um, but I, I I, I'm listen. I'm a half glass full kind of woman, and I just think that's a that's a tough pull, yeah. because what we're really talking about when we talk about long term care is people helping people to the toilet and feeding them mm -hmm. and giving them medicine and driving them to their doctor's appointment. Now, can you sell that to a young person as a career yeah. like that? And so, I don't know the answer to that. I wish I did. 
Yeah, no, I mean, I, I hear I, you're exactly right. I mean, I think it's going to have to be, I mean, you have to, you have to incentivize, you have to really support these individuals, hard jobs and pay benefits, you know, respite. I mean, there are things that just need to be core if you're, if you're going to bring, you know, you're going to um, attract a workforce to help this pop, um, the populations. I mean, it is, I mean, it, you know, I, I, I used to work in a clinic as a primary care doctor. So, uh, I was, it was a clinic for what they call in-home supportive services, IHSS workers in California, personal care attendants. They had benefits through Medicaid because they were a formal IHSS worker. The amount of physical ailments these caregivers had, sometimes they were even just as sick as the people they were caring for behavioral, mental health. So, you know, these are things that you have to have a robust um, suite of services, benefits, and supports. Otherwise, for, the, for these folks, otherwise it, it's not sustainable. They're, they're also going to be sick as well as not wanting to go into the field. Yeah. So yeah. I think what I would say is, you know, maybe stories for all of you. There are programs to try to create pipelines, you know, to incentivize college students to, like, why would this path be, you know, worthwhile? What could you do? Um, I would say that would be one thing to, to consider. There is an initiative in California, a, a significant amount of dollars were invested by the state to a program called CalGROWS. And this is an initiative for helping with um, workforce. So you can, and there's going to be some data that'll be coming out of that as well that I think would be useful to look at as an example. Uh, but there are things that people are testing out, um, but we got to move fast because, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're. Yeah. We're in a crisis. Last yeah. call for questions. OK, one more. Hello, Miss Michelle Singles. Hurry. <laughs> <laughs> I see you on TV all the time. I didn't know you were a caregiver, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so a little dog. Oh, anyway, yeah. dog. Your story's been excellent. I didn't know that was you out in the hallway. Yeah. <laughs> so my question is, I know you're very smart, so the government has probably came up with a more, most cost-effective way through all of this with the nursing home being 100000 a year, home care giving $50,000 a year, and then long-term health care. So what's your whole look on that? Because you know they've already figured everything out, which going to cost them less money. <laughs> so what, what's the crux of your question? I mean, what are you asking me exactly? I'm not sure I know. What, what, what do you think is the government's uh, way of, I guess, dealing with the less cost of what's going to so cost with all these different mitigate some variables? Because nursing home is 100000 a year. Yeah. Yeah. Home care giving is $50,000 yeah. a year. So the long-term care insurance premium is going to be, I guess, a lot more. Right. So they've already figured that out. So I think there has to be a holistic approach to the cost of long-term care, and that's the kind of things that you guys can write about. It's going to take a whole bunch, because you're going to have to talk about housing. You're going to have to talk about the workers who are going to be giving this care, and how can we support that. So the cost... <sighs> I meant overall. Overall. Because they're already looking at all the numbers. They already know what it's going to cost for all of these different things. Well, they do, but they're not doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, yeah. well, I shouldn't say they're not doing anything about it. I, I, I think Sarita's right that there are more efforts on the state level, but the states are so under siege right now in terms of finances. So they can only do so much. And there is a huge population, particularly that middle part, um, who don't qualify for some of the programs that the states are developing. You have to be poor, 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 and then maybe a little level of the poor, and then there's a whole middle class people um, who are not poor enough and not rich enough. Mm -hmm. And that is the, the unsung folks, the people, and they are angry and confused and not sure what to do because they did everything we told them to do, right? They went to college, they got a house, they got a job, they put their head down, and now they're aging. And a lot of the programs they can't, uh, um, get help from because they make too much money. And I mean much money, like, you know, over a thousand, you know, uh, like my, my best friend is a caregiver to her mom, and she's, she, she has a pension, a teacher's pension, it's just above, like I think maybe she gets 26,000 or something like that. It's just above the level at which she would get state help. Uh -huh. What does she do? Right? Yeah, you spend down, right? That's right. what we're seeing. Uh, we're seeing a lot of that. Yeah. yeah. I am going to end by saying one of the most powerful things I've heard over the past two and a half days 
was when, Sarita, you said um, the unhoused living on the streets, yeah. the aging process and the, and the impact of the hardships. Mm -hmm. You know, a 50-year-old person who's, who's on the streets probably looks 70 or 80. Uh, I think that imagery conveys to me the, the uh, need for us to tell stories and to convey information that drives this point home in a way that could possibly lead to change. Um, so we've heard so many slices of conversation over the year, including I had no idea you had the depth of experience as a caregiver that you've had. So when, we, when I named this session Scorecards and Bottom Lines, I had no idea of the depth of intensity with which they would send all of you home and send back to your newsrooms to start working on these kinds of stories. So I need us to take this opportunity to show our thanks to Michelle Singletary and Sarita Mohan. Thank you. And with that, we've reached the end of the National Press Foundation's America's Long-Term Care Crisis Journalism Fellowship Program. I'd like to thank all of the journalists in our program for uh, sticking with us and uh, being such good, responsive participants. And I'd also like to thank our sponsor, AARP, because this is the second year we've been able to build on this cohort of journalists who are developing a level of expertise in aging issues that truly can make a difference in uh, the way Americans age and age well. So thank you all for being here.